This video covers my fifth look at my personal Astrocade collection. In this video, I'm going to cover two video game books, two catalogs by JSNA, the original company that sold the Astrocade through Bally or for Bally, a Chain Store Age catalog, which has got some great pictures, some video graph paper made by Spectre Video that allows you to uh, graph out uh, screen RAM, um, a really great trifold. I guess it would be a folder that has biographies of interactive uh, lifestyle artists from Chicago, uh, handwritten programs by Mark Keller, many, many, many pieces of miscellaneous documentation, uh, a newspaper that was released by NCE slash uh, CompuMart that has the complete Bally Basic Manual in it. This is something that is online at Ash Bally Alley, but it's hard to see it except in this video. The five high-res packages that describe how to transform a Astrocade into high-res mode. Uh, it's pretty deep and detailed. And this is by Michael Matt from 1986. A disassembled MPT-3 uh, uh, console from about 1981 or 82. A disassembled Astrocade with most of its components removed from the PCB. Let's get started. We have two more boxes to look at today. Um, this is going to be an unusual episode uh, of this collection, because uh, inside this box is, is just about that much material, and most of it doesn't need to probably be talked about too much. And this is kind of uh, something new. I got this in the mail a few days ago, maybe about a week ago, from my uh, friend Ward. Um, we don't chat too much anymore, but I sent him um, a letter, and he uh, asking for my uh, Astrocade back that he was uh, trying to take apart, so he was going to uh, desolder all the stuff off of this Astrocade in here. And um, which he pretty much finished, but he, then he was going to scan at a really high resolution just the, the PCB. Uh, but he never got around to doing that, and I thought maybe some of the parts from this motherboard might be able to help me, but probably not. But I still thought I'd um, go through this box because he sent me back more than I expected. He also sent me back an a, a MPT 03 console that I had given him, but I guess uh, he started taking it apart and stuff about five years ago and never got around to finishing that one either. So he just sent it back to me. I don't know what use I really am going to do with it, but he also sent me some of the cartridges for it. So look at that. Um, it's not really Astrocade related, but I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I will show you. Uh, so let's dig into this gray box first here. Um, it's interesting to note a couple things. This has been out in the garage just, uh, I don't know, two years, three years. It was covered with so much dust. It was at the top of the stack sure why there's so much dust on here. I'm glad it's plastic. I've washed it all off. The other thing is, I want to thank my wife. She's a funny lady. Uh, when she came home the last time I was making a video, like a few days ago, I think it was Friday when I was recording a video, and I this here is our china cabinet, and this is a blue blanket that I um, cover it with so you don't have to look at all the things inside of it. And she knew I did that, but when she came home, it was facing the opposite direction. It was like the other side of this blanket, which was basically, to me, looks exactly identical. And she's like, why do you have it facing the wrong way? I was like, what? And so she said, face it this way. It looks better. I said, okay. So now it's facing the correct way. Uh, and if anyone notices a difference, let me know, because I don't notice a difference really, but you know. Uh, so let's dig into this one, see what we've got. Here I am showing two books again that have nothing to do with the Astrocade, but since I'm reading them, and I'm almost, uh, I just got these in the last few days, I thought I'd show them off. Uh, this is a book on the Nintendo's uh, Game Boy Advance platform. This is another platform studies book published by MIT, and um, I got this one only yesterday, on a Sunday, uh, and it's uh, written by Alex Custodio. Uh, don't really know too much about it, but I figured I couldn't go wrong, it's in a, uh, a platform studies. Uh, and this one is called Missile Commander, A Journey to the Top of American Classic by Tony Temple. And um, I don't know if he's still the record holder, but he was a record holder for until at least recently. And I read about two thirds of this book. It's um, this one I'm going to show. This one has no pictures or anything in it, but I thought I'd open this one briefly just to show you that there are plenty of pictures in this one. Well, I don't show any there, but they're colored pictures too, which is uh, kind of nice to see. And I kind of feel like some of this I've read, I mean, some of this I've definitely read in other places, but um, I feel like I've read some of Tony's stuff maybe on a blog somewhere. Certainly, I've, I must have read it somewhere. Maybe he's written for Retro Gamer. I don't know. But um, uh, and he's, I've heard him on a podcast. I think the Ted Dabney experience, I think. Um, well, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, great book. I recommend this one for sure. This one, I don't know. I haven't read it, so I can't recommend it. But it's part of the platform studies. And I uh, mentioned one of those books for the Turbo Duo last one of my last videos. And that's pretty good, too. So that's that. Now what's inside this box? This gray box here is made of plastic, uh, and I wish I had a lot more of these boxes. I've actually tried buying more boxes that can hold 
folders. They work pretty darn good, but the problem is uh, I don't like the smell of the ones they make nowadays. And they smell nasty. Uh, well, did you expect more to be in here? Well, so did I when I took it down off the shelf. Uh, this one just has three folders. One, I think three, yeah, two, three. So we're going to explore them together, not by looking at them in the box, because that wouldn't make a lot of sense. And some of these are just pads, but I'll show you what they are. They're interesting. And, oh, well, that's where these are. Well, look at that. I've been wanting to scan these entire things in. I only scan the Astrocade stuff out of here. Well, cool. Uh, that's probably good to find. So that's just that's just great. I didn't realize this was in this box. So uh, another reason I'm making this video, and I've mentioned this before, is to find... What am I talking about here? I'm like talking like, oh, yeah, this is so cool. So these are the two catalogs that feature... Um, the Astrocade in it from 1977, or maybe 78. Um, they're in great condition. It also shows some of the other items that are available at the time. But we'll close it out, uh, and we don't need to check out if this in this format. We're going to make this a little easier to look at, and then we will uh, move along to the other box. Not going to take too long to go through this one, is it? So right here we have products that think. Uh, this is from JSNA Enterprises. These are the people who originally sold the Astrocade. This is actually the products that they had out at the time. This is their catalog. And this is their, another catalog that they had out around the same year, I think. Um, and then we have something called the, the uh, Chain Store Age Catalog, which this one I have scanned and it's available online. It's one of my favorite things I've ever found in the Bob Tavers collection. I don't really know if it was something created by like Bally or what? If anyone can tell me where this came from, I'm going to do a close-up of these individually. These are probably some of the more interesting things in this, uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the uh, other boxes. Here is JSA and A's first catalog, uh, a collection of the most advanced microelectronic consumer products, and they are often credited with making some of the uh, first overhyped ads uh, that would appear in um, catalogs. Uh, and magazines, and, they, and rather than looking like ads, they look like articles. Nowadays, you have to put something like, uh, it says, like, special advertising section above those kind of things, but back then they didn't, so sometimes you couldn't tell them apart from the actual magazine, even though they were ads. Uh, so here we have the digital clock radio, available in 1978, a programmable computer game. I don't know what that is. It looks like a calculator to me. A CB radio, solid-state thermometer, Printing calculator. Uh, what else? Uh, button free micro recorder. That's a little teeny tiny recorder. Actually, what's interesting, if anyone's familiar with these tiny tiny recorders that use the little cassettes, um, I think there was one or two people who were using them in the Astrocade community at the time. Not, not this exact recorder, but to record their um, stuff, which is interesting because the fact that they were able to record it and get it back, uh, the quality of these is quite terrible. Um, here's another calculator, and computer scale. Wow, interesting. Uh, and telephone answering breakthrough. And then we have the Bally Arcade, and this is a color ad that lasts for three pages, I believe. And this is all I've scanned out of this one. Most everything else in the, in the Fabris collection, I've scanned everything, but uh, I didn't have, um, I, I, I don't know, the day I was scanning this, I didn't have the patience to do the whole thing, and so it was just part of it was scanned. It'd be kind of good to get back to it and do the entire thing. Uh, let's see here. So this is a lot of hype. I go through, oh, I guess it's just two pages. Maybe the other one has three pages in it. Uh, this is the first, uh, I think, home console, not home console, the first home pinball game. This is also by Bally. Fireball. Um, a little teeny tiny TV. I mean, I think the TV on this is two inches wide. Something like that. Very tiny. Uh, remote control racer, pocket CB, digital watch breakthrough. Wow. <laughs> Great, great stuff. Okay, I'll turn the page, look at the back, and it's talking about digital watches, and uh, let's continue on to the other catalog. In JSNA's second catalog, it says also a collection of the most advanced microelectronic consumer products. It's catalog number two. For all I know, there was a hundred catalogs. I have the first two of them. You open it up, and I think that this is the, possibly the, in, no, I was going to say this is the inside of the, um, Astrocade, but it must not be because that right there is a 6800 CPU. So I don't know what that is. Uh, it talks about uh, who they are. You get a jogging computer. Don't know what that is. A printer breakthrough. A telephone revolution. And I think at this time it was pretty new that you could buy your own telephone. 
I don't know if it was brand new, but it was... Let's see what it says here. Uh, no, I'm getting distracted. Don't get distracted, Adam. Look at that. A faux leather phone. Maybe it's real leather. I don't know. A phone system. Pocket CB. Telephone answering machine. Here we go. Awesome. This is the Astrocade in all of its glory, along with something that never was a real product. So we have the Bally Home Library computer, and along with this like keyboard, and it didn't come like this. Uh, so I think this one's three or four pages long. Yeah, this one's three pages long. So we have this um, mock-up of what the Zgrass keyboard would look like, along with it, um, its own cartridge slot, but it's not a real product. Totally, totally made up. Uh, and this is the actual... Astrocade that has the gold leaf and a red button. And that is, maybe this is a feature of the Astrocade. Oh yeah, this is, so it's four pages. It talks about dial a bargain, how you could log in using your Astrocade and make purchases online. Pretty advanced for its time, of course, not something that ever happened. Compares it to the, uh, uh, the Apple II and other systems, the Sol, Radio Shack, the Fairchild Channel F, uh, the Heath Kits, the Apple II, I think, I have the PET, the home library computer, and of course, compared to the Apple II, the home library computer is way better. I mean, it's just leagues. You've never heard of Apple, have you? All right, that's why, because the uh, Bally computer took over the world. All right, video pinball. I used to have one of these. So this is a five-page ad. I wonder if I scanned the whole thing. I must have. Uh, video pinball, I used to have one of these, but I didn't have a power supply for it. And since I'm a dope, I didn't realize that um, the power supply from my 2600 would have worked with it. Uh, blood pressure monitor, doctor's help. My wife, who is a doctor, should probably see this ad. I showed her some uh, ads from that she was interested in, like uh, talking about how cigarette smoking is good for you and stuff like that, uh, from the 50s and 60s. Uh, she got a kick out of those. Uh, pocket yellow pages, the VTR revolution. Look at that. These are some movies you could buy. Uh, at the time, here are movies that you could get in 1978. You could get The French Connection, Patton, Hello Dolly, Dr. Doolittle, um, never heard of this one, Tora Tora Tora, Fantastic Voyage, Vanishing Point, Cleopatra, which is a great movie, The Hot Rock, don't know what that is, like Rock Hudson, I, I think that's a picture of Rock Hudson, um, MASH, and on and on. So yes, the VCR did actually catch on, didn't it? Another remote control product, uh, don't ask me what this is, but it's a digital watch, how revolutionary. Um, <laughs> look at that, wow. Okay, that's enough. This one's pretty thick, so I'm gonna stop it there. Uh, 37 pages and it keeps on going. Uh, but yeah, the Astrocade was first uh, in this one. Let's take a look at the uh, chain store catalog. As I'm going through this, keep in mind that this has been scanned in pretty high quality and is available from BallyAlley.com. You can download it and look through this with me. Um, up here in the corner, it says Advertisement, and then it says Chain Store Catalog June 1978 Video Games. It only talks about the Astrocade, or excuse me, at the time it was the Bally Arcade or the Bally Home Library computer. I guess we'll find out. But we're going to open it and we're going to see what's in here. We have the Bally Arcade, drawn in a uh, hand in a hand drawn style, similar to what you might see in Atari advertisements at the time. And it's talking about the name of the game. Uh, so, Chain Store Catalog General Merchandise Edition, June 1978. I have no idea where this came from. If you have any information about the source of this, I mean, besides that it came from the Bob Fabris collection, uh, let me know. I, I love this piece of uh, this piece of catalog, piece of paper, pieces of paper. Uh, so read it. It's got some great illustrations. Um, talks about things that I've not seen in any other format. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Keep on going. Keep on going. This is what the inside of a catalog looked like, or the inside of an arcade looked like at the time. Um, this is some guy doing his sophisticated work, it looks like. Um, Bally Basic, list, input, A, semicolon, clear, for N equals 79 to minus 79 step. And well, I'm not sure what that should, I should type it in, see if it does. That's funny. Um, here's something that's a little bit intriguing to me. So you've got your Bally Arcade, you've got your Bally Basic, you've got a tape recorder you can hook up into it, then you have a little receipt type printer. So I've never heard of them actually saying they were going to have a... Uh, printer, but if they ever did, maybe they were hoping to have a um, little receipt type printer. But these are products that they, they never marketed their own uh, cassette tape recorder. Um, unlike, like, for instance, the Nintendo, well not the Nintendo, but the Famicom, it did have a computer sort of for it, that, or basic anyway, that had a keyboard. And Nintendo did make their own cassette tape recorder for it. I've only learned this recently. Uh, Kevin Bunch and I have been communicating back and forth 
um, through some emails, and uh, it's been fun. I've been uh, reading about the Famicom Family Family Basic, I think it's called. Um, he's been interested in uh, comparing it to uh, the Valley Basic. I, I don't know if he's doing it for his own self or for research. I'm not sure. Uh, Kevin, fill me in on that. Uh, all right. What else we got here? Uh, okay. I have a question for us. Uh, viewer, listener, eventually you'll probably get to this video. This here is a picture of something that was released and it was available in stores and I've seen it in, and the reason I know it was actually in stores was because uh, in a newspaper ad um, showing what the ballet looked like, this little um, point of sale setup is there. But there's a really high quality version of this available in someone's collection who, whose last name starts with DeSalvo. Uh, and if you get a chance to send that off to me, I'd like to scan it and put it up on Ballet Alley because it'd be nice to have like a actual high-res scan of that rather than just like a photograph that's, uh, you know, but, but what you sent us is better than nothing. And um, Michael, if you ever want to do the podcast again, let me know. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, Galaxy Ranger, I guess that's another Bally, um, uh, what would you call it? Um, pinball. I don't know. What would you call it? I can't think of the word pinball. Here's what the inside of a mall look like. Here's them setting up some arcade games and building them inside of a warehouse. Um, that's a pretty neat little picture. This is similar to another one I've seen, but not the same. So this is probably something put together by Bally, because obviously this is, these are Bally products. What's the back of it look like? Yep, here we go. Introducing Bally Basic. Yeah, pretty, pretty great little uh, catalog. All right, let's move on. Uh, through past this and see what else we have in this bat box. Can you make out that these pads here, these are each pad, paper, they each have the same thing on this one, the same thing on this one. And these were released in the, uh, 1982 by Spectre Systems. Uh, that was made up of Brett Bilberry and a few other people. They uh, released two cartridges uh, for the Astrocade, like third-party cartridges. And they, uh, in order to help them along, they made some of these um, pads, and they sold them in the Arcadian, maybe through Cursor or two, the newsletters. Uh, and this basically shows every single pixel that's available on the Astrocade screen, and so does this one, but in different formats in uh, useful ways for a programmer. Uh, so uh, if you are going to be making your own graphics, and they did use these themselves, because uh, Brett Bilbray, who um, wrote the missile attack game, uh, ICBM attack, he, uh, he lent me his collection so I could scan it, and there's actually... Uh, color pictures that are hand drawn um, on on these pieces of paper. So and these are each one. Each of these has been scanned. And if you're interested, you can look at them on uh, ballyalley.com and download them. And I've actually used them myself uh, when I've actually been uh, going through some uh, source code just to note what's happening on the screen. Because especially on this one, you can tell it marks here. Let's see if I can show you. Uh, so on this side of the screen, it tells you. So this byte here is the beginning of screen RAM. And so it says, I can't tell if I'm showing this correctly, but it says 4,000. And that's actually not said the word 4,000 because that would be decimal, but it's 4,000 hex. And so that's this first little tiny, teeny, tiny square there. That is the first pixel on the top line on the left-hand side of the TV. You probably can't see that one because of overscan. Maybe you can. You probably can. Um, and then it goes all the way across, all the way to get to the bottom. And starting right here in basic um, is the pretty much the last you can't see any of these lines because that's where basic holds variables and arrays and things like that um, you probably don't know what the heck I'm talking about because uh, unless you are a little bit familiar with programming that would make a lot of sense but these are useful uh, for programmers uh, but let's leave it at that and if you're interested you can look up these Spectre Systems uh, pads on uh, Bally Alley and download a page of each and print them on your printer and use them yeah they're a pretty neat uh, product from that time period I bet you're thinking, why am I showing this so small? I have, the, I can t fill this entire frame here with this, but am I doing that? No. And that's because what this is, is a something that folds out, and is a trifold, and it's got a front and back, and it has, um, it's for uh, people who are active in the community. This is from 1985. It was a show going on, at some exhibition, um, and I'll open this up so you can see a little bit about what it's like inside of it. So we have Copper Gillith here. It's funny, I was just yesterday looking at some of her um, uploads that she has on Vimeo. We have a chance of, she has a rec uh, collection that uh, she uploaded about five years ago of her video art that was working on the UV-1. And it's about 22 minutes long, I think, or 25 minutes long. I watched it just yesterday for the first time. And I was actually gonna try to leave some feedback about it and I totally forgot and here I am looking at something, here's a picture of her. 
Um, there's our studio, uh, Phil Morton. He was someone who was involved in the community. I know he he died um, young. I, um, I'm not sure when. Um, this is Dan Sandin. He's partially responsible for um, a lot of video pe video art in the Chicago area because he created something called the Image uh, Processor in 1973. Um, here's some more work. This is available on ValleyAlley.com, and uh, if you're interested in it, you can read the entire thing there. It's a pretty neat uh, read. I'm going to zoom in on that, make this so you can actually see what it is. And uh, like I said, this is from an art exhibit that ran from February 22nd to March 17th, 1985. And um, at the time, I was living on the East Coast, a little closer to Chicago, but I was only 13 years old, so or maybe 12 years old, so I was not about to go to uh, Chicago to see something like this. In fact, at the time, in 1985, I had a Commodore 64, didn't know anything about the Valley. That was in my future, yet to come. I guess all futures are yet to come, aren't they? Going through this paperwork is making me realize I was hoping... Um, that in an upcoming video I could show off half of a box of a Bob Fabris collection box, and there's eight of those. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it now, because I'm just looking at these few sheets of paper here, and these are uh, um, compilations of programs written by um, Mark Keller, and they're all handwritten. Um, I'm going to show you these a little close-up. This is a little booklet he put together. Um, he's got several programs in here. What does he have? He's got... I don't really know too much about this. But it's a Star Trek 3, version 11.2, Chase 3, uh, version 1, Space Battle 9.0, Bombardment 2, Bullseye. These are all in here. You could type them. I don't think these have been archived, and I wouldn't be typing them in because most of them are handwritten, and they even have crossouts and things like that. I don't know if you can see this, and they're pretty faint. They're available on Valley Alley in black and white. Uh, this was, I scanned these early on in my collection because they were part of the Richard Hauser collection. And, uh, yeah, he, uh, that was when he was living in California. So this was sent to Richard on November 26th, 1980. Oh, I'm not showing that very well, am I? Here's the postmark. November 6th, 1980 is when this was sent. And, uh, so there's a whole bunch of, uh, paperwork here. And it's all has to do with these. So here's Life 3.0. Here's some programs, uh, by, uh, David Marlowe called... Wavemaker? Hmm, not sure what that is. And the Hex Memory List. Um, yeah, this is not a very good way to do this, so I'm, I'm not sure how I'm going to go through the Bob Fabris collection now. I'm, hmm, I'm kind of stumped. Um, life... Yeah, alright, that's that. I'm going to show some other things now because there's, you can't really tell what that stuff is anyway, can you? Right? Can you tell what this is? No, I can't. Alright. This is a bunch of miscellaneous material. Here we have the Valley Manufacturing Warranty Registration. Um, so, put a stamp there, fold it in half, put some tape there, send it off to Valley, and um, it would have been recorded, in, and uh, you would have had, uh, I think, a 90-day warranty on your system. Many people had to send their systems back in 1977, yeah, right there. 90, can I see that? I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully you can see that by my thumb, it says 90 days. Uh, then we have... Uh, in my last video, or a couple of videos ago, I was showing my cartridges, and there were stickers on them. And this is what the stickers came from. It came from uh, uh, these. These, like you'd pull this off, whoosh, and then you'd put this on your end label of Star Battle, and then you'd have to be able to see what it was if you had all the cartridges stacked in, like, say, a shoebox or something like that, you know? Put them all in a shoebox. And uh, so that's where they came from. Here's some of the original stickers still on the plastic. This is the football cartridge, the manual. I'm not sure why it's in here. I usually have all my manuals in a different place, but it's kind of interesting that this one's in here because I'll show you why. Uh, this was written by uh, Bob Ogden, and the audio was by Scott Norris. He did most of the audio for the systems. But the manual, which looks like this, very briefly, all the manuals are pretty simple on for the Valley. Very simple manuals, not like Atari's. Um, but this manual came with actually two playbooks, one for the, I think, yellow team and one for the blue team, although I think they were actually identical. Um, and these are the plays you could have for football. Never played the game. Um, interestingly enough, it's considered uh, probably the best football game of its period. It came out in 78, so it, for that time period, it's, it sort of says it says 81 here, but the original one came out earlier. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty neat. Uh, here we have some uh, documentation to Jim Fauci. Jim Fauci is a person who gave me my first Blue Ram in about 1998 or 99. He lived here in Albuquerque, and uh, it, this is a note from uh, Clyde Perkins, who was the father of John Perkins, and he uh, helped make the Blue Ram. So this is August 6, 1982, and it says, um, this is 
just I don't know how it was sent to him. Maybe he just wrote this and stuck an envelope. And Clyde says to Jim, he says, as um, your order was being uh, packed, a glitch appeared in the blue RAM being tested. The final remedy was a modification of the PC boards. After uh, retesting your order, will be shipped uh, Monday or Tuesday. Uh, and then it says, does it say August? Oh, August 9th or 10th. Uh, new instruction manuals will uh, come out a little bit later. And there you go. And here's something that he probably got that with that same product. And can't really see who this is because it's being protected. But it's a letter uh, with Artillery Duel. It basically says that here's a prototype of the future game that will be coming out. And this is dated... Is there a date on this? No, of course not. Nope, there's no date. But this is a, a version of a, the letter that said, Hey, uh, we're making a new game for cartridge that's uh, Artillery Duel. And here's a sneak peek at it. You load it and you can load it into your blue RAM and you can... Uh, if you have 300 baud basic, it takes five and a half minutes to load, which is a long time. Uh, this is scanned. You can check it out in Valley Alley. This is funny that I came across this because this just came up recently on the Astrocade News Group and um, not News Group, uh, Astrocade Discussion Group. Uh, and uh, I, I actually pointed maybe not to this exact uh, documentation, but something similar to it. And next up, we've got what, two more things to look at. One of them is a newspaper of all things. Not sure how I'm going to show this. I'm also not sure how to scan it, but I have taken pictures of it and put it online. And this is pretty unique. They talked about this in the Arcadian. It was in the Arcadian collection. This is from a company, which you can't see here at the bottom, but it says uh, NCE CompuMart in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they got Bally's permission, which I think is pretty neat, to take the entire Bally Basic Manual for their customers so that they could be like, I think I need a Bally Arcade. And I'm going to not really easy to see here, but it's a newspaper, so I'm going to back out. It's going to not look easy to see, but it's not easy to find. I mean, it's not easy to see in any format. I've tried scanning this. I really don't know what to do about it. But this is going to be what the newspaper looks like inside. So what we've got here, they're saying a, a color and sound computer system. This is from about 1978. Maybe it's from about 1979. And it's an actual newspaper. It's yellowed. I don't know how yellow it looks here. It's got some handwritten notes on the sides. Um, and it says Tiny Basic and ROM with audio cassette interface underlined in red with the red marker. And when you open this up, the entire manual is inside. Like, if you were interested in, to know what the capabilities of Valley Basic were, you would open it up and you saw this. This is, this is a typical size of a newspaper. Maybe it's a little bit smaller, but not by much. And the entire Valley Basic manual is inside of it. Look at this. I'll try to keep flipping through here, but the pages are kind of stuck together. Of course, on video, when I tried to do this a minute ago, it didn't give me any troubles. So why would it give me troubles now, right? And if my head was in that video, I guess it might have been. Who knows? Um, so here we've got pages 20 to 26. So we've got nine pages here, another nine pages here, ending on page 37. This explains everything about the language. No, not, not just explains it, it, this is the manual for it. I mean, has anyone uh, who's watching this ever heard of anything like this? Did, did Nintendo ever do anything like this? Did Bally? Well, Bally didn't, but um, this was done for the Bally. Did, let's see, who else would have been around the time? Atari? Apple? Anybody, like, just put your, their basic manual into a, or any of their manuals into a newspaper format and give it away for free? I mean, I, I don't think so. I mean, this is pretty unique in my opinion. So, newspaper, newspaper. Look at that. Look at it. it just keeps on going. So far we're on page 80 or 93 of the manual. And oh here we go. Composition F. So I think there's actually maybe an error here. So this is interesting. I mean I've seen it before but it's been a long time since I've looked at this. A couple, several years. Many years. Um, so perhaps they were wondering uh, what this, what these lines were doing. Yeah. Neat. Neat. I love looking at stuff like this. And here's the end of the manual. And this is what the back says. This is not from the, from, um, what would you say? It's, this is just for the ad. This is not actually inside of the manual. So I'm gonna do a little bit of close up here to show you what this is. Zoom in, I don't know if you can see that any much better. And I'll try to weave my way through this. So exciting program cartridges, cassette recorder, Valley Basic, the interface. These are the cartridges that were available in 1978, I think. Let's see, what do they say? 280 Zap, Dodge em, which is one cartridge. Um, Seawolf and Bombardier, which I don't, I've never come across the game called Seawolf and Bombardier. I mean, I've come across it in many other places called that, but I have, I've never seen a cartridge with that name on it. It usually says Seawolf and Missile. Um, big deal. Same thing. Um, Panzer Attack, 
And here it says Kami Baron, but that's not what it was called either. I never noticed that before. It says Panzer Attack and Red Baron is what it's called, not Kami Baron. Wow. Does it really say Kami Baron there? Let's look at that. Come on. It does. It really does. I'm not just making this up. I'm not making it up. It says it right there. Kami. Oh, you can't see my finger. Kami Baron. Look at that. Interesting. All right. Back up a little bit. I guess I don't need to back up too much, but a tiny bit. Look at that. Man. This is such quality video. <laughs> Man, I'm glad I've gotten over trying to make videos exact. This also makes it so I can get some video output. And not just because I want to throw a video out there because I make money off of this, because obviously I don't want to get a hundred people, a couple hundred people at the most will look at this over the next year or so. Um, but it, I just like sharing my collection. Uh, so here at the bottom, we have their order form. Now, they have a store. I imagine you could go into it. If anyone knows anything about this NCE CompuMart, I think I looked them up several years ago, and I did find some information about them. Uh, but I don't remember what, I, what it was. So here's their order form. The games were $19.95 each. How much was an uh, equivalent Atari game? That is something that was interesting. I've, I've always noticed that the cartridges for the system were 20 bucks a piece um, in most places, instead of, like, I think typically... Um, like about $30 for Atari cartridges, but I don't know how much they were in 1978 or 77. Uh, give some comments of, or if you know on the bottom. Uh, okay, and that's the back, and we have one more thing to go through in this box, and I'm going to briefly touch on what's in the box for the that was sent to me by my buddy, and we will stop this part here and go on to the one final folder. I was always impressed with the Bob Fabris collection, that, and that's an understatement. I mean, it had a lot of stuff in it. Um, Paul uh, Thacker also knows about this, that there's just some things you just never heard of before before you got the Bob Fabris, we got the Bob Fabris collection. Things that weren't mentioned in the newsletters, really, um, and that were total shocks and surprises to me. And this is one of those. This is a lot of pieces of paper, lots of it. It's all been scanned, it's online. Um, this is dated uh, after the, I think the arcading was already done. Uh, July 3rd, 1986, it's to Bob Fabris. Here says Robert. It's by someone named Michael Matty, and I would say his name Matt because his name is spelled M-A-T-T-E, but I've been corrected because he and I speak on a weekly basis now. And the reason we speak now is, uh, and this is 2021, uh, the reason we speak now is because when I started the Bally Alley Astrocast, I wrote to this person because of this. I was like, hey, can I get in touch with you? Uh, I've been, I'd looked for his number or his address a few times, and I finally found it. It took a... It was hard, and he only and he lives relatively close to me. Um, I'm not going to say exactly where that is, but you know, in a state that's n semi nearby. Um, but he uh, still around, and he still he wasn't really he hadn't thought about his astrocade in a while when I contacted him. Uh, but I said, hey, what are you doing? Um, do you are you the are you this Michael Matty who uh, came up with what is this about a high res astrocade? And this is how to build one, a circa using the parts from. 1986 and how he did it. Now, since this time, Michael has gone on to create another high-res unit, and he's actually, just as of two weeks ago, he started posting his very first video on YouTube, and it was, um, it's, it's about his high-res units. That's what his priority is going to be. And in fact, just uh, yesterday, I got an email from him that talked about how the work he's doing to um, capture the footage because he's written some high-res programs. So we're going to go through this rather quickly. You can check out all this. This is uh, scanned in complete detail. And plus more because he's written a lot of tutorials that I've put online in the last year or two uh, about not just high-res, uh, but how to add RAM to your unit and kind of fix your unit and things like that because he's also very good at fixing astrocades that break. Uh, okay, so this is package one, and this is all downloadable. It tells you how to... Uh, here's scans. Here's the schematic. It opens up. And he based this on the UV-1. So some of the information in here, if I recall correctly, Michael, if you're watching this, uh, correct me if I get some of this wrong. Um, I might. I'm doing this from memory. I haven't looked at this in years. Oh, I guess not, maybe not quite that long, but quite a long time. Here's the Valley's motherboard layout. He's labeled it really well. Um, unfortunately, it's really hard to get across how, like, how much work well, maybe it's not. I mean, this, I'm going to go through every page here. Maybe I'll just skip out in the second box. Uh, this is just a beautiful, it's like a piece of art to me. And I've mentioned that to him. Is like his work to me is more than just um, hardware. Like this is like a, a power supply you can make for your Astrocade. But it's more than that. It's, it's, he went through so much effort to get this across. And then it's a shame it wasn't really shared with anyone at the time to uh, upgrade their unit. 
As far as I know, M Michael, let me know if there was a way that you were able to share this information with anyone besides the Astro, uh, besides the Arcadian. And um, I know now people can look at it, and people have commented on it, and there's a thread on the Atari Age uh, webpage under the Astrocade subforum uh, that's pretty long that has a whole bunch of information from Michael. So I'm just going to go through. Here's the RAM board that works with it. I'm just going to go through. You can download this and check it out yourself. RAM board, more RAM board. More about the RAM board. This is all drawn by hand. You should see the quality, the this, this care he put into this. I mean, take a look at this and you're going to be amazed. Um, open this up. More schematics. Um, and I guess maybe for anyone who maybe never heard of the Astrocade before, this could be your very first video. Um, the resolution on the uh, Astrocade is actually, um, what is it, uh, 160 by 102. And that's on the consumer model, which is the Astrocade, the version like what people call the Astrocade today. And it, uh, so that's the quarter of the re resolution of that the chips inside the Astrocade are capable of. But there wasn't enough RAM inside the Astrocade to make it go into high res mode. and it was never really meant to. Uh, so maybe at some point in the future they were hoping to, but the, the arcade games like Wizard of War and Gorf, I've mentioned those before, um, did use the same custom chips and they did use high res mode. So instead of having a resolution of 160 by 102, their resolution was uh, 320 by 204. Um, same amount of colors and everything, but other than that, uh, they, they had the same resolution. And so his system is capable of that resolution. Um, both from this one that he modified in 1986, and uh, he took out a storage a few years ago uh, to see if it still worked. He still kept it. Um, I think it might have had some issues, but he was able to fix them, and it works now. And then now he's upgraded it, and he's... Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about what he's done to it, but he's got uh, some more stuff you can read about. Um, look at the What's New section of BallyAlley.com if you really want to know. Um, here's his audio video board. Um, so you can have... I think it's composite out. I think it's composite out. Um, yeah, man. Good stuff in that one. So that's the first package. I think it's like four or five packages. Let's see. I'm just going to keep on going through them. I think it's five packages. Yeah. So second package here is the low high resolution modification procedure. It tells you how to do it. Um, and he had and he wrote them on tape back then. And um, I don't know if he has these originals, but he has definitely sent them to me. You can download um, the a WAV file and load it. But you'd have to have an Astrocade that can support uh, high res in order to do to, to load the software and use it. And I actually have the source code for it, and it's also uploaded. Thank you so much, Michael, for doing all this work. Uh, wow, it's I didn't expect to like go through this page by page, but I just start making these videos, and I start seeing what's in my own collection, and I'm like, wow, Adam, your collection rocks. And it, it just it's just is really a nice collection. I mean, why am I saying that to you? Do you, you? You can tell how cool it is. Just look at this. Look at this. And if this doesn't get you excited about the Astrocade, well. Play an Astrocade game, you'll be like, eh, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is what people did. Like, people went, one person decided he was going to make his Astrocade have four times the resolution that it could have normally. And he wasn't the only person to do it. There was at least one other person um, who did it. John Perkins did it, the person who uh, made the RAM upgrade. But it wasn't generally done. Um, maybe there were some other people out there who did it. Um, if anyone in the Astrocade community knows of one besides Michaels and John Perkins, um, upgraded uh, high, for high-resolution Astrocade, let me know. I'd, I'd be interested. I know that some people, um, I think even in the 80s, I think I'm from I'm remembering this right, I remember reading about some people would get second-hand um, motherboards for the arcade games and um, play around with those. But they were not motherboards for the Astrocade, so I don't know if that really counts. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to kind of skip through this really quickly because there's this one is detailed. If you want to know how to upgrade your... This is... Uh, it's outdated information, but it's still worth checking out. It's, um, and, yeah, and Michael, you, you did a, a good job here. I, I, lo I love that you went through this, this work. So here's copies of the uh, Datamax UVR1 schematics. UVR1? UV-1R schematics. Which I think the UVR1 was the latest version of it. Um, and he says here that, um, and he says, I paid $30 for just one set of prints, 21 drawings. The above address is as of July in 1984. So he wrote to them, um, and probably Tom DeFonte or had one of his people in one of his classes or something like that, uh, copied the, uh, made copies of the UV1 schematics and sent them off to, uh, to Michael. So that's how he was able to come up with some of his ways to upgrade his Astrocade motherboard. Because obviously the, um, the board for the, uh, 
the system for the UV-1 was not using an astrocade motherboard. It had its own stuff. So I'm not going to keep opening every single one of these, but they... Man, it's... Hmm. Uh, yeah, and like another thing about the um, the video I watched yesterday that um, was by Copper Gillith, um, there's actually a UV-1 on video in there, and she's uh, it's being demonstrated at the museum in Chicago in 1980 for a television show for the local news. Uh, pretty cool. Um, and that's, uh, so b basically when he's done with this, he's got a 44K expansion RAM, um, plus the 4K built in, and, and well, f plus the 16K. So I guess, how did that work? I think it would be 16K for the video RAM. Then there was an additional 44K. I'm not sure there'd been another 4K available somewhere there, I think, to add up to 64K. It must've been used for something else. Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe, or maybe, I can't remember. I mean, I've looked at this, skimmed it. It's been a while. It's been a, been a while. Um, man, this is... Oopsie daisy. It's starting to come apart. Oh, this is just one page. And here we are. Pretty nice, right? Here's the box that uh, Ward sent back to me. Uh, I'm going to open it up, and it's full of packing material. I'm going to eventually bring it all out a little bit separately and you can see what's in here. Uh, there's actually a couple of different things in here that I'm going to show off. Uh, some stuff not for the Astrocade, but I'm going to show it off anyway. Uh, so this is uh, a cartridge called Boxing and it's for a system called the MPT... Uh, MP, oh, you can see there. Uh, MPT-03 and uh, I'll show what a cartridge looks like. Now, this is a system that is... Um, these games would run without any modification on the Arcadia, but if you've, if you've ever used an Arcadia game, you know that they don't look anything like this. But the programs are identical. The cartridges will not fit, though. Let's see what else we got here. Let's put that aside. Um, and Ward was taking this apart because he was curious about how the system worked. Uh, here's the joystick for it. Now, another thing you might know about the Arcadia is it has analog joysticks. Well, this one has an analog joystick that feels like an analog joystick, unlike the Arcadia's. And this is a much better, listen to the click. Nice, much nicer keyboard and uh, controller than the Arcadia has. Um, here we have more cartridges uh, for the MPT system. And the system has been taken apart. Um, these are, these little bits here would screw on top and then it lets your controller work. But I'm going to. Try, I'm trying to work my way to the astrocade that's underneath here. So here is what the system looks like. The controllers will go here. They can fit right in there and snap in and almost look like they're part of the unit. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to take this out without damaging stuff here in a minute. Um, let's see. This is the top of the Arcadia or of the the astrocade. So like the buttons and stuff. I'm not going to bother taking it out of here. What I want to show you is the motherboard itself. Uh, so here's some more uh, about that MPT system. Maybe I'll put it back together. I think it worked when I gave it to him. It might have some kind of issue. I can't remember. Um, oh, here's the power supply for it. Pretty interesting. And yeah, by the way, the reason I bought this for myself, I forgot I'd even given this to Ward. Uh, the reason I had it was because I wanted to uh, have a new Arcadia and I'd sold mine. And I, when I bought this, even though I knew better, I've forgotten that it wasn't uh, cartridge compatible with the Arcadia 2001 by Emerson. So uh, I got it and it was not useful to me. In our, and since Ward was a big fan of the system, I gave that to him. So here's the um, RF modulator for the Astrocade uh, motherboard. Um, here's a TV connector. You've seen many of these before in your life, probably. Um, this one looks brand new. Woo! -hoo. Game! Let's play the game! All right. Uh, let's get in here. So this is the motherboard for the um, MPT-03. And one of these chips is the 2650 CPU. If I could see better, I could, uh, I think that one is it. Does that say 2650? You tell me. If that says 2650, then we're good. And if that is the, um, I don't know what that says. I think it's upside down. I don't know, it looks, I can't remember what the, what the chip is called that does the graphics for the Arcadia, but I think that's it. So I'll, I'm going to try messing with this to see if it works. All right, under here, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. Move some of this, get this out of the way. <gasps> Look at that, it is another dust cover for the Astrocade. So here's the Astrocade stuff. Now this is kind of sad, but this is okay. Because this is what I had asked Ward to do, and he did this for me, but he just never got around to finishing it, which is fine, because it was his idea. So this is all just parts. These are all parts off of the motherboard. And I can't really tell very closely. 
but uh, he snipped them all off because I wasn't planning to reuse them. The system did not work when I gave it to him. Um, so it was just basically, I wasn't even considering it a parts board. And this is a power supply for the Astrocade. And of course then we have the, uh, what do we got here, the case. In the bottom of the case, or this is the top of the case. And I already, I don't think I found the bottom of the case yet. Here's some more. Um, hmm. I skipped looking at this last bit. Uh, I'm gonna have to do some editing there because there's uh, some, this is the RF shielding is what it turns out to be. And uh, there's an address I, I don't want it, I didn't want that to be seen. So let's take out some more bubble wrap. And what else we got in here now? Bubble wrap is out. Now we have the, um, the motherboard for the system. As you can see, it's missing all of the components. Nothing is there anymore. It's all been taken out. Um, and I think Ward tried to take out the, some of the chips carefully, but it doesn't really look like it, but that's okay. Um, I mean, this the, the whole point of this was just an exercise to see if he'd get it off as clearly as he could and cleanly as he could, um, so that he could uh, show the traces in high-res scans. Uh, that never exactly happened, but you know. Uh, one one reason that the Astrocade has uh, some issues with heating is this is the bottom uh, heat shielding for the PC. And while it looks like, let's see, where is the bottom of this case? The bottom of the Astrocade's case has these heat shields, or heat vents, so like air can get through here. Well, explain to me if this is a, if this, with this big heat shield, RF shield is on there, here, how are these vents doing anything at all? I don't think they're doing anything. But hey, what do I know? I'm just, I'm just some guy making a video. Uh, now let's take a closer look at the, what else we want? I'll take a closer look at this with a little more steady. Oh, one other part that's in here. I don't want to miss that because it's pretty cool looking. All right, can you see it from your angle? I th think you might be able to. Um, this was the box that uh, the original MPT system came in. Uh, this, I guess for some reason Ward broke it up, but that's okay. Uh, it wasn't very good shape to begin with. Uh, so the intelligent game, right? This is what the system's joystick looks like. It's got a little connector on top, and it has really neat overlays. And some of these um, games, like this is called Brain Games, and I actually have a pretty in-depth thread about this game, and a video about it too, if you want to check it out. Um, but I played it for the Arcadia. So yeah, bicycling. Yeah, some, some pretty cool stuff. Um, that's that. I'm gonna do a little bit showing more of the Astrocade motherboard and then uh, wrap this video up. We're all done. And the next video, you're gonna see me start going through the Bob Fabris collection. I'm not sure how I'm gonna do that yet. Um, I'll figure something out. In the meantime, hope you're enjoying this video. Stick around for another two or three minutes while I show you the PCBs, the component side, which has no components on it anymore, and the solder side. This is an Astrocade that makes me sad. It also makes me happy because it is serving a function, and that is that an Astrocade can die and not to be sad about it. So I'm opening this up. I'm gonna show you an Astrocade in, in a sad state. You got your dust cover, as usual, put that aside. Uh, you've got your power supply, as usual. This one feels like it's coming apart. It's, it jiggles inside. You've got your RF connector. And when you open this up, you've got, you know, your top of your uh, case. And I, this does not come off like this. This has just been snipped off. I mean, uh, this was all normally. When, I don't think I've ever opened up one of these on, on an Astrocade before um, to show what it looks like. Really, uh, this is RF shielding. I think the RF shielding originally went like this, something like that. I, I can't remember. What I need to do is get an Astrocade that's not been, um, that's not working and just take it apart. One that's never been opened before, but is dead. And um, just show what it looks like from the, oh, taking one part off at a time to show. Um, this is the 50 pin connector. Let's see, I think over here, let's, man, I can't even remember the layout of the system right now. That would have been the data chip, I think. Um, you can't see too well. Here's all the bits that were on here, all the bits. I'm gonna do a close up of this so you can check out a little bit better. So it's a bit sad to see a, 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 an Astrocade in a state like this. Um, but then again, at the same time, um, you might learn something from this. Maybe I will too. This one is, um, 
you know, uh, it's got broken parts on it. This was all removed in a way to not make it so it could be put back together. It wasn't meant to ever be put back together. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I'm going to try to get a little bit closer up and uh, maybe one day we can get a scan of this or at least better pictures of it that doesn't, when these aren't on there because the, uh, these are the sockets for the custom chips. Um, all right, so I will take it and so we can just see the PCB itself. Well, in case you're wondering, since this was uh, the PCB was sitting on top of this metal shielding, how is it doing that without getting shorted out? Well, there's a neatly uh, placed uh, piece of cardboard that protects it uh, so that the, um, the, the uh, solder side of the uh, PCB doesn't uh, touch the metal and ground out or short out. This is the Astrocade's uh, PCB. This is the component side with most of the components removed. And we've got the, um, a ruler here to show you how wide it is. It's 11 inches wide by, I don't even know, let's see. 11 inches by about eight and a half inches. Um, so that's how, how big the motherboard is. But now I'm gonna do it a little bit closer so you can get a better idea of what it looks like. This is the component side of the motherboard once more. Uh, I wish I could do, get a little better angle where I'm looking straight down on it, but I can't, uh, unfortunately. So uh, that it is what it is. Um, I'm going to get uh, the board layout printout that I have of this, and I'll help you out understanding where parts of the boards are. In the meantime, I'm going to flip it, and you can see the solder side. Uh, I'm not sure how important it is to see that. This is the 50-pin connector. Um, and this is, I guess, a later revision, because here you can see that this is a connector that was used for testing in the factory in the, I think, the very earliest motherboards, and that isn't available here. And I think some of the early other boards, they have a uh, something here you can use, too. All right, so I'm going to put that down again and see if I can't uh, get my PC board layout, and I'll show you exactly what some of this is on the board. Yeah, I've got a case of the gilts right now. This is a PCB that's never going to see the light of day working again. This is the board layout for it, and for any Astrocade, actually. Basically, this has got some differences here. Um, from This is from the very, very original Astrocade, and some of the, uh, there were some upgrades, minor ones, for the later revisions of the Astrocade motherboard. Uh, I'm showing this because... Uh, my buddy Rick just called me while I was actually in the middle of making this video, so thanks for calling me, buddy. Um, and he wants to help me get my Astrocade that I zapped uh, going again. And he already did do some uh, phone tech support with me, uh, but he wants me to do some, uh, swap some chips into a working motherboard that I have, or actually maybe it's the opposite. Yes, yeah, take some of the chips from my dead motherboard, put it into my working motherboard, and see if, if it has the same symptoms for the uh, Astrocade that I zapped a few videos ago on film, live, woo! Good thing, Adam. Um, so uh, here we have custom chips, like I was saying. So this is the custom data chip. This is the one that sometimes gets zapped. The custom address chip and the custom I.O. chip. Uh, so this would be uh, uh, U17, 18, 19. Here we have, I think this is the Z80. I don't know this motherboard very well, and I don't have what, what explains the designations. Uh, so J6. So I. Actually, maybe that would have been, you uh, you would have been, the, the U7 might have been the Z80 here. I can't remember. But this explains what all this is. Um, I've got a line filter here. I actually have it here so you could see what it looks like, where it would have gone on. It would have been neat as if, um, while Ward was desoldering this, I mean, this was done long before I was making videos. Uh, if he cut it as he was soldering the pieces off, shown how that was done. But that wasn't the point. The point was just to try to get a good quality scan of this, which... I might try to make a scan of this and desolder these myself. We'll see. I'm not very... I mean, I can desolder okay. I'm not very good. Not without damaging the board. Not that I guess it matters in this case, but I want to make it so it can be... so you can look at it. Um, but I'm going to do one quick close-up of this once more. Flip it over. Maybe show a couple of parts of the board close-up. And then I am done with this video. We've gone through two boxes. The last two boxes I need to go through before I start going through just Bob Fabris' part of the collection. This is the component side of the motherboard again. What I was going to try to do, and I'm going to do now, but I've tried it a couple times already and it won't work the way I wanted it to, is I was going to zoom in to show you where uh, this part number is for the motherboard so you can see if this is any different than one you might have. If you can even get any details out of this, I don't know. Um, but since I'm showing this off and I may never show it off again, I, might as, I figured I might as well show the part number. And I was zooming in on it and it just totally loses focus. So I will make a cut and then we'll get to that. Uh, but what I'm not going to do is maybe show different parts on the board just real quick via cuts. 
this is the top right corner of the component side of the motherboard and um, this is here because I want to show the part number which is A084-90701 etc. You can probably read it hopefully if it's in focus and here's some of the traces on the motherboard and uh, I'll maybe show the back side a little bit, maybe the same area on the back just for the heck of it and then um, we'll continue on to look at the Bob Fabris collection uh, next time. As promised, this is the solder side of the upper right corner. Now it's the upper left corner because this is the uh, solder side. Uh, this is where the PCB's uh, ID is. And um, this is just the back. I'm just showing it to you so you can get a little closer look at the solder side, see the uh, other side where the traces are. Is there really, really, really reason to see this? Probably not. Um, but it looks cool. How often do you get to see a motherboard up so close for the Astrocade? Not often, I presume. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, come around next time if you're not bored to death of these videos so far, and we will jump into the Bob Fabris collection. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.